Welcome back to the course, Seeking Jesus. My name is John Hilton. Let me begin with a question. We know that Christ is going to be crucified, but who are his main opponents in his arrest, trial, and crucifixion? Would you say A, the Pharisees, B, the chief priests, C, equally the Pharisees and the chief priests, or D, the Romans? People often get this question wrong. If we were to look at the scriptures, there's a heavy emphasis on the priests. Notice just a sample. Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests. Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude from the chief priests. The chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus. When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. In fact, if we were to take the chapters on Christ's arrest, trial, and crucifixion, we would see that Pharisees are only mentioned twice, whereas priests are mentioned 59 times. Clearly, the chief priests have a major role in Christ's arrest, trial, and crucifixion. The temple was a large organization with thousands of priests. The chief priests were those who oversaw various aspects of temple administration. It's important to realize how the government in Jerusalem worked. Although Rome was clearly in charge, Pilate didn't live in Jerusalem. He lived in Caesarea, a city about 80 miles northwest. The day-to-day -day administration and enforcement of Jewish law would have been overseen by a council known as the Sanhedrin and some of the chief priests would have been a part of that group. In the accounts of Christ's arrest, trial, and crucifixion, the emphasis is on the chief priests, so I want to highlight a bit of what we know about their lives. Over the past few decades, archaeologists have discovered several priestly mansions dating to the time of Christ. These mansions are very close to the temple. And I use the word mansion specifically because these are very large homes that were clearly owned by wealthy individuals. If you ever get the chance to go to Jerusalem, I hope you'll visit these mansions. A few years ago, I was in Jerusalem with my colleague Matt Gray, a professional archaeologist. He pointed out the contrast between the lifestyle of these priests and those in Nazareth. For example, in this home, which would have been occupied at the time of Christ, you can see there's a beautiful mosaic on the floor. In contrast, most people who lived in the Galilean region where Christ grew up had dirt floors. These mosaic floors suggest a level of opulence found among the elite in cities like Rome. Or look at this nice bathtub for indoor bathing. Some of you are probably thinking, I have a better bathtub at my house. But in the time of Christ, this type of indoor bath was a rare luxury. Expensive imported tableware and serving dishes have also been found in this area, as well as the remains of frescoed walls and beautiful exterior columns. So whoever is living in these houses has enough money to decorate and live in ways that the very elite were doing throughout the Roman Empire. Now you might be wondering, where are the priests getting all this money? In recent years, there have been changes in tax policy, and the priests have been more involved in the selling of animals at temples. With this context regarding the lifestyle of the chief priests, let's look at their reaction after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a council, and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him, and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Remember that the chief priests and other leaders have a financially advantageous relationship with the Romans. They keep the peace and are rewarded for it. If we want to give this group the maximum charity, we could read this verse like this. Jesus is becoming really popular. The Romans might become worried that he'll start a revolution and they'll come and take away our place, meaning our temple, and that would be disastrous for our nation. It's possible that that's what they meant. Or based on what we've been talking about with the wealth they've accrued as part of their Roman connections, there's another possibility. Perhaps they're saying, if everyone starts believing in Jesus, then Rome might say, why do we need the chief priests? They might take away our place, meaning our position. That's another possibility if we want to be less charitable in our interpretation. At this point, we're introduced to Caiaphas, the high priest. He's an important figure that you'll want to remember. He's referred to dozens of times in the New Testament, sometimes as Caiaphas and sometimes simply as the high priest. Caiaphas said unto them, ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. In context, Caiaphas is saying, Jesus is a renegade. We've got to put him to death. It's better for him to die than our whole nation to be at risk. Now, John, who's authoring this account, makes a comment on Caiaphas' statement. John says, And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. 
In other words, John's saying that Caiaphas was unintentionally prophesying that Jesus would die not just to save the Jewish nation, but to save all of God's people. The result of Caiaphas' words? From that day forth, they took counsel together to put Jesus to death. In our recent classes, we've been looking at Christ topically. We've seen Jesus in miracles, the Savior's parables, sermons, and connections with individuals. Starting with today's class, we'll do a sequential study of one week of the Savior's life. Over the next five classes, we'll explore Christ's experiences from the triumphal entry through his resurrection. Today, we'll discuss the time leading up to the Last Supper. The Savior's triumphal entry signals the start of Holy Week, this last week of Christ's life. Several elements of the triumphal entry may have seemed threatening to the Jewish authorities because they indirectly proclaimed Jesus to be a king. For example, his riding on a donkey was reminiscent of when Solomon rode on a donkey when he was crowned king. Moreover, the Old Testament prophet Zechariah had written, Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem! Lo, your king comes to you, and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey. Matthew specifically points out that Jesus was fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy by riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Other subtle aspects of Christ's triumphal entry suggest that he was coming as a king. Shouting, Hosanna, was done when Solomon was crowned king. Spreading palm leaves and cloves on the ground had been done for new kings in previous centuries. And as we talked about in a previous class, calling Jesus the Son of David hearkened back to an Old Testament prophecy that a descendant of David would always be on the throne. This idea of a Davidic king was prominent in non-scriptural writing at the time of Christ. An influential document known as the Psalms of Solomon, written a few decades before Christ, states, See, Lord, and raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over Israel your servant in the time which you choose, O God. Undergird him with the strength to destroy the unrighteous rulers, to cleanse Jerusalem from Gentiles who trample her to destruction. Can you see how, with these words as part of the cultural context, to have multitudes of people shouting, Hosanna to the son of David, could seem threatening to those in charge. In Luke chapter 19, we read, As Jesus was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. In other words, they felt that the disciples were making a ruckus and that Christ should calm them down. But the Savior answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. That's an interesting phrase. What does that mean, the stones would shout out? There's probably not one right answer, but I love what this Christian leader, Natalie Rigoli, says. Jesus is not literally saying that the stones on the street will open their mouths and sing hymns. What he is saying is that all of creation was made to exalt and worship the Lord. And if we will not do it with our words, God's word is still preached. The example to follow is that of the early apostles after the resurrection. We should never become complacent or fearful of God's message, hoarding it to ourselves or remaining quiet for fear of judgment or condemnation. We should be bold in our testimony and faithful in our witness, vocal in our praise, and confident in our hope. If we remain faithful to God and publicly proclaim His name to the world, the rocks will join us in singing, and sin will lose all of its power to oppose the purposes of God. I hope that's something each of us feels in our hearts from the triumphal entry. Even the rocks wanted to shout out and testify of Christ. Will we join the rocks? After the triumphal entry, in Mark chapter 11, verse 11, we read, Jesus entered into Jerusalem and into the temple, and when he had looked round about upon all things, and now the eventide was come, he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. Mark next records sandwich stories of a fig tree and the temple cleansing. As we'll see, a focus of both of these stories is hypocrisy. The Greek word for hypocrite means an actor, someone who's performing. Let's start out our sandwich in Mark chapter 11, verse 12. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, that's a key phrase, he went to see whether perhaps he would find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. That's always been a bit confusing to me because it says it wasn't the season for figs. So why would Christ have expected to find figs there? Here's some background. Fig trees normally bud leaves after the figs appear. This fig tree is budding leaves, but there's no fruit. 
As a symbol, this fig tree is a hypocrite, acting as though it has fruit by showing forth leaves. For a moment, we'll skip the middle part of the sandwich, Christ cleansing the temple, and jump to verse 19. And when evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. As we've discussed, we can learn from the connections in the stories that are part of the Mark and Sandwiches. In between the accounts of the fig tree is Christ cleansing the temple. In Mark eleven fifteen, we read, Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling and those who were buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. When I was younger and pictured this scene in my mind, I would imagine Jesus going inside a modern-day temple where people were selling stuff in the baptistry or something like that. That's not what it's talking about here. The image you see on the screen is a reconstruction of what the temple complex would have looked like in the times of Jesus. In the center is the temple, but there's a large open-air courtyard outside the temple. Most people didn't actually go into the temple itself, but would congregate in the area outside the temple. Today, the Dome of the Rock occupies the place that the temple you see in this image once did, and the same platform exists. It's huge. You can fit more than 50,000 people on this platform. Here, you can see these beautiful columns and shaded areas. This might have been a place where you would find money changers and people selling animals for sacrifice. So when it talks about Jesus entering the temple, don't think of him walking into the Salt Lake Temple. It's more like he's at Temple Square in a public space. And when Jesus sees people buying and selling in the temple complex, he intervenes to disrupt them. Jesus said, Is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. When Jesus refers to the temple as a den of thieves, he's echoing words given by Jeremiah. Jeremiah lived at the same time as Lehi. In around 600 BC, they were both prophesying that Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Babylonians, and this in fact happened. About a decade before Lehi left Jerusalem, Jeremiah went to the temple in Jerusalem and prophesied these words from the Lord. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Therefore will I do unto this house as I have done to Shiloh. Is Jeremiah called the temple a den of robbers? He was saying that God will destroy the temple. In essence, he says, your holy place won't save you because you aren't holy. And in fact, shortly after this prophecy from Jeremiah, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon. So when Jesus says, you have turned my house into a den of thieves, it's though he's saying, do you remember how Jeremiah said your temple was a den of thieves? That temple in Jerusalem was destroyed, and your temple will also be destroyed because you are doing what the leaders did in Jeremiah's day. Within a few decades of Christ's words, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. As Christ disrupts this merchandising in the temple and calls it a den of thieves, who is he really irritating? There are undoubtedly many people who are affected by Christ's actions, but a major group that's negatively impacted are the chief priests who administer a variety of money-making ventures at the temple. In the Synoptic Gospels, this appears to be a catalyst for Christ's arrest and crucifixion. Let's step back and look at these two events as a sandwich. The fig tree looks like it's bearing fruit, but it's not. It's a hypocrite that needs to be destroyed. The temple should be a place of holiness, a place of prayer, but it's become a den of thieves, a place of greed. Hypocrisy is rampant at the temple, and like the fig tree, it will be destroyed. Hypocrisy is easy to find in other people. We can look at the chief priests and think, wow, they sound like terrible people. But my guess is most of the chief priests woke up in the morning and thought that they were good people, making the world a better place. How about you and me? If we look inside our hearts, is there any hypocrisy in us? This is probably something we all struggle with. As a simple example, I think about my driving habits. When I'm trying to merge onto the freeway, I want people to give me some space and let me in. But when I'm on the freeway and someone's trying to merge, I sometimes think, hey, get in line, buddy, after me. There are probably many areas in our lives where it's a look in the mirror opportunity. Take a moment to think about your life. In what areas do you detect hypocrisy? How could you change these areas? The next event I want to discuss takes place shortly before Passover. And I think it's especially interesting because in Matthew and Mark, it's the only event that Christ specifically asks to be remembered. We're going to discuss an anointing woman. In our previous class, we talked about an anointing woman in Luke. Here, we'll discuss the anointing woman in Mark. In Mark 14, we read, After two days was the feast of the Passover and of unleavened bread. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might take him by craft to put him to death. 
A few verses later, we read, Judas sought how he might conveniently betray him. This is another Mark and Sandwich, and in between is the story of a faithful woman. We read, While Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. Note that phrase, she broke open the jar. The image here is of complete sacrifice. She's not pulling out a cork so that she can later reuse the bottle. She's breaking it and pouring out all the oil. Perhaps in the phrase, she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head, we can see connections to other passages of Scripture. Christ's body was broken for you. He poured out his soul unto death. But rather than acknowledge this generous act, some of Christ's disciples were upset. But some were there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me. For you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for its burial. The Savior recognized this unidentified woman's act as an anointing connected with his impending death. The Savior then made the following declaration, Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Taken as a whole, this passage begins with a plot by the chief priests as to how they can arrest Jesus. The next seven verses focus on the worshipful act of the anointing woman, with the final two verses turning to Judas, who's agreed to help the chief priests capture Jesus. The juxtaposition of these stories draws a sharp contrast between those who love and those who oppose Jesus. In his final hours, there are those who adore and anoint him and those who scheme to end his life. Perhaps in the sandwiching of these events, it's like Mark is saying to us, as the end approaches, you have to choose. Which side are you on? Held up for us as the example of a faithful follower is this anonymous woman. I love the insight from scholar Julie M. Smith. She said, this woman receives more praise from Jesus than anyone else in Mark. In Mark's gospel, it is not the twelve, but the anointing woman, among others, who is presented as an ideal. The disciples deny and avoid Jesus' death but the woman acknowledges it, honors it, and responds appropriately to it. Mark's gospel is focused on the theme of discipleship, and the anointing woman is presented as a model disciple. The anointer is the only person in Mark's gospel who understands Jesus' identity during his mortal life. The broken vial and the complete use of the ointment serve as symbols of the completeness of her sacrifice, and thus suggest that she foreshadows Jesus and his own sacrifice. It's significant that the Savior praised this woman, saying, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she hath done shall be spoken of for a memorial of her. I'm grateful we could take a moment today to tell her story, and I pray we'll find ways to emulate the love and devotion she had for Jesus Christ. Let's turn to one of my favorite topics. It's something Christ teaches in the Gospel according to John shortly before the Last Supper. If someone were to say to you, What was the purpose of Christ's atonement? What's the first thing that pops into your mind? For many people, the first thing that they think of is something relating to Christ's suffering for our sins. That's an important aspect of the Savior's atonement. Scholars sometimes refer to this as penal substitution, meaning Christ suffered the penalty for our sins. He's a substitute for us, standing in our place. Another possible answer to the question, what was the purpose of Christ's atonement, is to conquer Satan. This probably isn't the first thing that comes to our minds, but it's another important aspect of the Savior's atonement, and Jesus emphasized it in his final hours. He said, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, meaning Satan, will be driven out, and I, when I am lifted up from the cross, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. Christ teaches that in his death, he will be conquering Satan. Later at the Last Supper, he says, the ruler of this world has been condemned. Scholars call this the Christus Victor model of the Savior's atonement, that on the cross, Christ overcame the devil. Many scriptural authors have testified of this principle. For example, in Hebrews 2, we read, since therefore the children share flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. 
It's very clear in this verse that through Jesus' death, he destroys the devil. Paul also taught that on the cross, Christ disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Christ's death didn't overthrow a worldly kingdom, but rather he accomplished a cosmic victory by overcoming the devil. What I want to highlight is that when we deeply know in our hearts that Jesus conquered Satan and won the victory, it can change the way we feel about our lives. Here's an analogy. Imagine watching a sporting event in which you care deeply about the outcome. What if you knew from the outset that no matter how far behind your team was, no matter how many mistakes your favorite player made, no matter how bleak things looked, your team would win? Can you see how this would totally change the way you watched the game? You would have a feeling of peace and assurance even if things looked bad. So here's the spoiler alert. Jesus wins. The Doctrine and Covenant says that we can have confidence in the triumph and the glory of the Lamb who was slain. I love what Judah Smith, a pastor in Seattle, writes. Regardless of the state of the world or the poll results of your favorite politician, Jesus is still in control. He wasn't voted in and he can't be voted out. He rules and reigns over the affairs of mankind. Because Jesus lives, I can live differently. I can act and react from a place of peace and an attitude of assurance. Jesus is in control of my past, my present, and my future. Despair over my past failures or fear over future problems cannot control my present because Jesus rules with me in peace. Then he quotes a passage from Colossians, which reads, Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Smith continues, sits? He's seated? Shouldn't he be pacing the sidelines, yelling at his team to run the play, make the pass, beat the opposition? Standing implies action, urgency, activity. Jesus should be standing. But Jesus is sitting. Sitting is the position of reigning. Jesus is not on his feet. He's relaxing. He's in heaven and all is well. All is finished. Do you ever feel like you're pacing on the sidelines? You're thinking, we've got to hustle. We've got to make something happen or we're doomed. That's not what Jesus is doing. He has already won. You and I just need to make sure we're on his team. Think about your life. What troubles are you facing today that you could let go of if you deeply knew that Jesus Christ wins? Are you carrying a burden? Sometimes we worry about superficial things, and sometimes we worry about things that are extremely serious. Either way, if we really know in our hearts that Jesus wins, if we're on his team, we don't have anything to worry about. We'll discuss the Last Supper more fully in our next class, but I want to conclude our time today by highlighting a couple of points. Like we discussed in a previous class, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Last Supper is a Passover meal. In John, it's the night before Passover because Christ is crucified at the same time the Passover lambs are being slain. But either way, Christ and some of his closest followers have gathered for a final meal. At the Last Supper, as they did eat, Jesus said, One of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? Note that according to Matthew, the disciples looked inward to see if Christ was talking about them. Luke portrays things slightly differently. He writes that Jesus said, Behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. They began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Can you hear the difference? Instead of, Lord, is it I, this is closer to, Lord, who is it? What lesson might we learn from this contrast? When I hear a general conference talk, do I think, I hope my brother is listening to this, he really needs it? Or do I say, Lord, is it I? How can I apply this talk in my life? Now, our main sources for the Last Supper are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the earliest record we have of the Last Supper is actually Paul writing in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians was written in roughly 53 AD, probably a decade or two before the Gospel accounts were written. It's interesting to see that in this earliest record of the Last Supper, Paul emphasizes the sacrament. He says, I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. One lesson Paul wants to highlight from the Last Supper is Christ instituting the sacrament specifically in remembrance of him. Recently, you and I had the chance to partake of the sacrament. Did we remember Jesus? Sometimes things can become so commonplace that we miss the meaning. Have you ever said a word over and over again until it loses its meaning? 
The same thing can happen with the sacrament or other religious rituals, where they become so routine that we don't remember to relate them to our Redeemer. Paul and Jesus want us to remember the Savior as we partake of the sacrament. As Paul concludes this section, he makes a statement that has helped me focus on Jesus during the sacrament. He says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. Most of us don't use that word shew, S-H-E-W. What does this word even mean? If we were to go back to our friend, the Blue Letter Bible, we would see that the Greek word translated as shoe means to proclaim publicly, or to announce, or to testify of. If we take one of these other meanings, Paul is saying, as often as you partake of the sacrament, you are publicly testifying of the Lord's death. That's powerful. It might not be a fast and testimony meaning, but you and I are bearing our testimonies anytime we partake of the sacrament. For me, that's changed the way I view the sacrament. As I take the bread and water, I think, right now, I am publicly testifying of the death of Jesus Christ and what that means to me in my life. Recently, I came across two statements from modern apostles that have also helped me think about the sacrament differently. First, consider this insight from Elder Neil L. Anderson. The title, Renewing Our Baptismal Covenants, is not found in the scriptures. It's not inappropriate. Many of you have used it in talks. We have used it in talks. But it is not something that is used in the scriptures and it can't be the keynote of what we say about the sacrament. The sacrament is a beautiful time to not just renew our baptismal covenant, but to commit to him to renew all our covenants, all our promises, and to approach him in a spiritual power that we did not have previously as we move forward. Second, Elder David A. Bednar taught, The act of partaking of the sacrament in and of itself does not remit sins. But as we prepare conscientiously and participate in this holy ordinance with a broken heart and a contrite spirit, then the promise is that we may always have the Spirit of the Lord to be with us. And by the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost as our constant companion, we can always retain a remission of our sins. I love these invitations to approach Christ in a spiritual power that we did not have previously and to prepare conscientiously and participate in this holy ordinance. What are some things that you've done in your life to make taking the sacrament a more meaningful moment? Recently, I asked friends on social media for their thoughts on this question and received several thoughtful responses. One person wrote, I try to hold the bread and the water in my mouth for as long as I can before I swallow. Even those few extra seconds of tactile experience with the sacrament has been wonderful. Another person said she reviews the sacrament prayers in her mind, but changes the personal pronoun to the first person. So, O God, the Eternal Father, I ask thee. For her, this changed her sacrament experience. For me, the insight we saw earlier from Paul that as we take the sacrament, we're publicly testifying of the death of Christ has helped me focus my thoughts on the Savior during the sacrament. We'll discuss more insights from Christ at the Last Supper in our next class. For now, I hope you'll be able to find some small way you could invite more power from the sacrament into your life. We've covered a lot of ground today, from the triumphal entry to the Last Supper. I want to conclude today with an observation that John makes just before narrating the Last Supper. He writes, Many, even of the authorities, believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human glory more than the glory that comes from God. Today, we've seen contrasts between adoring crowds and scheming collaborators. We've seen examples of hypocrisy and also deep devotion. We've seen disciples that ask, Lord, is it I? And others who say, Lord, who is it? How do we see ourselves in these scriptural accounts? My hope is that the time we've spent today focusing on Jesus Christ motivates us to draw closer to Him, not in word only, but also in what we do and what we are becoming. Thanks for staying until the very end. I want to make sure that you know there are pre-class readings for each of these videos in the course, as well as additional resources like PowerPoints and quiz questions to explore. Click the link in the description to access these additional learning resources.